BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you, Mr. Morris. Vicki Lyson, your host today. And our topic is one, well, I think it first would be best described with this moment of melody. Listen carefully, please. Oh, Lord, my God, when I an awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And if we were to give our program a title today, it would be, Then Sings My Soul. Our topic is hymn stories. Many of you listen to VCY America, the network, and uh, hear our overnight program called Music Till Dawn which focuses on many of the old hymns and gospel songs of uh, our faith and our trust. And uh, these songs are rich in doctrine. And what a thrill it is to consider these songs that literally speak to the heart. And a day when some people have said the music in the church has died, well, I want you to know that it's alive. Quite often we go out in the field and uh, have what we call Sunday night singspirations. And uh, we've got one coming up here in northern Minnesota coming up in June. We're looking forward to being there. We uh, have keyboard will travel. But uh, we've had a couple of them now at the Corn Palace in South Dakota. And it's not uncommon to see hundreds of people come together to sing, some driving as far as 100 miles away, to sing the songs of Zion. And today it's a privilege to have with us Mr. Robert Morgan. is a pastor and author of several books, including the newly released book, Then Sings My Soul, Volume 3. And in this studio where we do music till dawn, in my glass case just to the left of me, I have the first two books and now number three. And with that, we say a very special welcome to Pastor Robert Morgan. Pastor Morgan, good to have you with us. Thank you, Vic. It's so good to hear your pleasant and friendly voice. Well, we praise God for the the ministry of music to the heart. And one of the things that uh, I know has been expressed by so many people, young families, as we come together with these singspirations, is that they say, thank you for bringing these songs back. It's not uncommon for a person to come up afterwards and say, you know, I haven't heard these songs for 25 years. And even as uh, we usually wrap up with the song, How Great Thou Art, when we hit that chorus, Then Sings My Soul, you see eyes closed and people singing with eyes looking or face looking upward, singing to the Lord, How Great Thou Art. Why is it, Pastor, that you believe hymns are an important part to the Christian faith? Well, they represent 2,000 years of our musical and worshipful heritage. And they also represent another 1,500 years of biblical heritage, because hymns go all the way back to the book of Exodus, chapter 15. Uh, The first recorded hymn that we have was the Song of Moses when the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea, and they paused on the other side, finally realized they were liberated, they were free from Pharaoh and from slavery and from annihilation, and uh, Moses scribbled out a song, And it says that they sang, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea. Mm. And Miriam took her tambourine, and there was dancing and singing. And from that point on in Exodus chapter 15, all the way through the hymns and the psalms and the great nativity canticles and the gospels and the hymns and the book of Revelation and then into Christian history, we have 3,500 years of musical heritage Mm. to draw from. 
and that's just something that we don't ever want to lose. And you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the Last Supper, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Yes, well, the (laughs) Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all sing according to the Bible. Mm. Jesus sang in the upper room. It says in the book of Zephaniah that God the Father rejoices over us with singing, and the Holy Spirit, of course, sings through His Church, because the Bible says to be filled with the Spirit, uh, singing, speaking to yourselves, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with melody in your hearts to the Lord. So we have a God who sings, and it's not surprising that His children would sing also. Mm. The benefit of hymns versus uh, the lighter songs. Well, of course, there have been lighter songs all through Christian history, and when it says in uh, Ephesians 5, uh, in the passage that I just quoted, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that seems to represent that there's always going to be a variety of genres of Christian music, and of course some songs are a little uh, lighter and some are a little sturdier. Uh, We love the old hymns in particular because they are so full of theology. And when you read uh, or sing Charles Wesley's, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in My Savior's Blood, uh, then there's something about those great old hymns that steady us and give us strength and comfort for difficult times. And the music, of course, has been wedded to the hymns for so many years that it sort of fuses together with nostalgia and with spiritual meaning and with warm memories and, and with bright hope in our hearts. And so to pass those down to our children, to sing them ourselves and to have them in our songs and on our radios and uh, in our hymn books by our desk where we have our devotions. That's one of our greatest treasures as Christians. Pastor, do you believe that we are in danger of losing the traditional hymns? Well, I think we are. Uh, now, I'm you know, I'm not going to uh, uh, be negative towards uh, uh, contemporary uh, Christian praise and worship music because every generation has got to write its own music, and if there's ever a generation that doesn't, then, uh, you know, then Christianity is dead in that generation. Mm. But if we lose the old hymns while we're singing the new ones, we will be the first generation in history to have abandoned 34, 3,500 years of musical heritage. And you can go to a lot of uh, churches and never hear any of the gospel songs or the great hymns that have been sung by generations past or composed in earlier days. And that represents a great legacy that we have. And there's no substituting uh, Marching to Zion or uh, some of the great hymns that Fanny Crosby or Isaac Watts wrote. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Mm, You know, those are words that ought to be reverberating all through the history of the Church. And so I do think we're in danger of losing them. But with this uh, three-volume set of songs or set of books, Then Sings My Soul, Book One, Book Two, and Book Three, I'm hoping that uh, maybe at least for some people these hymns would be revived. Well, you know, the stories behind the hymns add so much meaning even to the writing of the songs. I, uh, I mentioned to you before we went on the air that my dad was a songwriter. Had written a number of songs, a little chorus called "Got Any Rivers You Think Are Uncrossable," and "A Name I Highly Treasure." These are songs that God has blessed over the many, many decades uh, since He wrote them. But they are songs again that He always considered a gift from God because it always focused the worship and attitude of of praise to God. And uh, the song, again, as I observe music, and I'm involved with music myself is that the the music and the words need to be harmonious. And I don't mean the chords and structure. I mean the spirit and the message of the tempo and all of the technology uh, needs to be right along with the words because sometimes it's like mixing oil and water with you, uh, finding great words, but the mechanics of what, what are done with the melody sometimes are very confusing. Well, and that's one of the reasons why Amazing Grace is such a popular and ageless hymn. Mm. The words are very powerful. It was actually uh, written as a New Year's Day poem uh, that John Newton used at the end of his sermon uh, celebrating uh, New Year's Day in the 1700s. He was asked to preach for the community on January the 1st, and he did so, and he 
use for his text the verse about David looking backwards with thanksgiving and looking forward to faith. Mm. And he summed it up at the end by writing the poem, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And later it was put to music, and the particular tune that he's used for that hymn uh, has become so married with the text, and the text and the music go together so mm, beautifully yes, right. that it's, you know, the music as well as the words is what has made that hymn immortal. And so to be able to match together the tunes and the words is a great gift. And, of course, one of the interesting things, Vic, is when you travel in Europe or you go to England, sometimes the words will be sung to a different tune. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that it's inappropriate, but I always have to readjust my thinking as I sing the old words to a British tune that's frequently sung in the churches over there. Uh, But it's so often regal and beautiful, and it's like uh, meeting an old friend all over again. Mm. Do you believe it's important for parents to hand down hymns to their children? Oh, yes. I remember my mother singing as she did her housework. She would sing when they ring those golden bells for you and me. You remember that song? Absolutely. And uh, I grew up in a church that sang the hymns. My father was in the choir for a brief period when I was a child, and for some reason I still remember him standing up there in the choir loft I guess my mother and father both were, and I was a little boy sort of abandoned in the pews while they were singing up in the choir, and I remember seeing them up there. Uh, But to, uh, you know, hymns are more accessible to our families now than they ever have been Mm. uh, because of the radio, because of CDs, and because of uh, downloadable music, and because of the Internet. We have greater access to more hymns right now for our families than we ever have had in history. And so we really have the greatest opportunity of any generation to teach our children these great hymns of the faith, and it would be sad to neglect such an opportunity. When you mentioned when they ring those golden bells for you and me, uh, the uh, pianist Rudy Atwood, who was a personal friend of my mother as they grew up in the same church together, but uh, in his senior years as Rudy was sitting down in, in his home church at the keyboard about to play that song, when they ring those golden bells for you and me, he played a, an arpeggio and, and b- moved into the song and then quietly slumped over and went to be with Jesus. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'd never heard that story. Yes, I've, he, I've known of him, but I didn't know that yeah. story. His, uh, his daughter was standing, sitting just a few feet behind the piano, and she slipped up. She said, Daddy, you're, you're, you're going home. Well, you know, I bet that he just continued playing. <laughs> but he's you got know, the most... I, I believe that we, we resume... Uh, pleasing the Lord on the other side of uh, death uh, within seconds. It says uh, uh, in Second Corinthians chapter 5 that Paul's ambition was to please the Lord, whether in the body or out of the body. Amen. And if we're doing his will and singing his songs on this side of the grave, I don't think there's too much of an interruption on the other side. We're going to be talking more about this. Our guest today is Robert Morgan. He has written the series of books, Then Sings My Soul, book one, two, and three, hymn stories, drawing faith from our great hymns, the hymns of our faith, drawing strength from them. And we'll be talking more about these. They are available, and uh, we'll be finding out about his website in a moment. If you're interested in getting a copy of these books, we have them available through Crosstalk. For a donation of $23 for the new book, if you simply call 800-729-9829. It's available for $23, and you can call even now. Mary's at the switchboard. It's a powerful book, a wonderful book, and we'll be talking more about this and uh, the great hymns of the faith when we come back. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris. Creation Seminar Speaker at the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, what do Jewish scholars think about the age of the earth? Chris, from the Old Testament scriptures, we conclude that the earth is only around 6,000 years old. Unfortunately, most Jewish scholars have long since abandoned a belief in the Hebrew Old Testament, taking it only for spiritual value. What's interesting to note is that the Jewish date, which dates from the time of creation, teaches a young earth. Just like Christians, they can add up the genealogies and come to this conclusion. Those few Hebrew scholars and rabbis who take Genesis seriously take also the days of Genesis to be literal days, and thus the whole creation is on the order of 6,000 years old or so. While some Christians and some Jews try to incorporate millions of years into Scripture, when you go back to Genesis and believe it, you only get a few thousand years. For more on Genesis, visit our website at icr.org. This is Chris O'Brien. Thanks for going back to Genesis.
And we're back with you on Crosstalk today and uh, talking about, well, the name of our program, Then Sings My Soul. Actually, it's the name of the book we're talking about, written by our guest today, Pastor Robert Morgan. A book that contains hymn stories, stories of how these songs were written, and uh, they're wonderful, wonderful stories, as well as uh, there's music in there. You can sing right from it as well. I think of the many songs that are there. Uh, Pastor Morgan, you have a website where people can access much more information than we can even talk about today. Why don't you give us that website? Yes, it's robertjmorgan.com, robertjmorgan.com. And one of the things we have on there, Vic, is for churches who would like to present an evening of sacred music that would cover the entire history of hymnody from biblical hymns to modern songs, uh, and tell the story all along the way and give samples of every era. We've put together a sample order of worship and some text there that would be helpful, hmm. because we want people to understand it and to know the history of hymnody. It's a very interesting story. Well, again, that website is robertjmorgan.com. Dot com. Okay, that's M-O-R-G-A-N. And, uh, folks, I hope that you'll access it there. If you're interested in uh, access to a copy of the book, and again, we've mentioned it's available through his website, or you can contact us through vcyamerica.org. Uh, the book is available through Crosstalk. If you simply call our studios for a donation of $23. Let's go a little further, because uh, one of the things I know that's inter- that is important, um, when when we think of how hymns impact the singer. I mean, you know, sometimes we get so used to just going through the routine of the words and melodies, but sometimes during our singspirations, I will say, now, folks, this next verse, I want you to sing it as unto the Lord. For instance, he is Lord. He has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. We'll use that chorus, and then we'll come back and do it once again, and I'll say, would you sing it this time? You are Lord, and sing it as unto him. And I think that is something oftentimes with the routine of, of simply uh, we have literally we can be very formalistic even in our worship services we mechanically go through these songs that may be there but to sing them from the heart and uh, sing them as unto the Lord I think is an important ingredient there are several things we can do like that Vic you know when we sing we are worshiping and we're also mm-hmm. reassuring ourselves it's a way of talking to ourselves uh, the great uh, British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say that our biggest problem is that we listen to ourselves instead of talking to ourselves. Sometimes we have to give ourselves a sermon. We have to preach to ourselves, uh, pick ourselves up and give ourselves a good talking to. Well, singing some of these hymns is a way of doing that. But we can also change the words a little bit as we turn them into a prayer and pray them for somebody else. Mm-hmm. There's an old hymn that says, Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, yes. to thy precious bleeding side. Do you know that hymn? I am thine, O Lord. Yes, yeah, I am yeah. thine, O Lord. Well, sure. I used to sing that when I had a child who was away from the Lord, and I would say, draw her nearer, nearer, precious Lord, and I would just turn that into a prayer for her by changing the pronoun. Mm. So hymns are sort of flexible in our worship patterns, and when you know the hymns or you have a good hymn book, you can turn them into prayers, you can turn them into sermons to yourself, you can turn them into bursts of worship, and uh, you can also use them in counseling. And, you know, when I'm preaching, very many times, now I don't burst into singing, but I will quote the words uh, to a hymn. Uh, th- there's nothing more powerful for a preacher than quoting a stanza, for example, uh, stanza four of the hymn that I mentioned earlier, And mm-hmm. Can It Be, says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Mm. So the words are so strong, we can use them in so many different applications as we go through life. It wasn't too many months back that uh, Joplin, Missouri, who we have people listening today in Joplin, went through a terrible tornado attack. Houses were disintegrated. We've had loved ones there who were in their home, and it was starting, the tornado hit. They went into a closet, and when they came out of the closet, that was all left was standing, and, and it was outside. There were suddenly no house anymore. Their cars were piled in the driveway. And uh, sometimes when you think of the song that can comfort the heart in times like this, uh, the storms of life really 
when I think even the story, if I recall correctly, of, of Christians when they were going to the lions in the catacombs, they were taken and, and placed in the arena, and the the lions would would attack them as entertainment for the Romans, and there were people that sang hymns on their way to their death. Well, during World War II. Many, many people in America would sing, Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. It was sort yeah. of America's hymn during World War II. And, you know, uh, uh, Vic, we were talking off there about the flood that struck Nashville a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And we had a number of families in our church that were flooded. Our church was flooded. Uh, it was a terrible time. But on the Sunday after the flood, we sang the song that says, The Solid Rock, and one of the stanzas says, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Oh, amen. And I just wish that everybody could have been in our sanctuary for that moment. It was so poignant when people who had lost their homes, and we had lost a good portion of our church, but we stood and sang about how he supports us in the whelming flood. These songs, you never know when just the right one is going to strike in your heart and be a great comfort. Sometimes at the close of a powerful message and the singing of an invitation hymn, and it's not for the purpose of just an emotional uh, mechanism, but uh, softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. But, uh, it's a, the kind of a song that uh, speaks very clearly, and the Holy Spirit can use it as a, a, a vehicle to touch the heart. Well, these invitational hymns are so wonderful. Charlotte Elliott uh, is the lady who wrote Just As I Am, without mm-hmm. one plea. She was an invalid in Brighton, England. She was very embittered against the Lord and uh, hostile, really, to him, and bitter because of her illness. And um, so a great Swiss doctor and psychologist, Cesar Milan, came to see her, and uh, he tried to talk to her about the Lord and about softening her heart and coming to an acceptance and recognizing that God had a plan for her life. And she resisted him until finally... Uh, she just said, well, if I were to come, how do I come? And he said, come just as you are. Mm, yes. And she responded to that and later uh, became a great uh, Christian prayer warrior and uh, poet and hymn writer and turned that phrase into her hymn, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst to me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Mm. Pastor, what's the most famous children's hymn that you can think of right now? Well, it's Jesus Loves Me, this I know, for the Bible tells me (laughs) so. Mm. And in Then Sings My Soul, Book 3, I tell the story. It's a very interesting story about that hymn. It was written by two sisters, Anna and Susan Warner. Their father was a very wealthy financier in New York City who lost everything in a financial panic, and the family had to uh, move out of town. They lost their home and their servants and their silver and their gold, and they ended up in a little ramshackled uh, Revolutionary War era house on Constitution Island across the Hudson River from the Military Academy at West Point. Mm. Uh, And in order to make ends meet, these two girls uh, began writing and became two very famous novelists in the 1800s. And they wrote a number of of novels and stories and, and became very prolific authors. And it was all trying to keep their heads above the water financially. And, uh, uh, one of the uh, books they wrote was called Say and Seal, S-E-A-L, and uh, in that they told the story of a little boy who was dying, and his Sunday school teacher sang these words to him, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, William Bradbury, the famous composer, saw those words, and he put them to music and created this uh, uh, famous and marvelous uh, children's hymn. Now, here's the interesting thing, Vic. When that song became so well-known, it influenced a generation of cadets who were coming to West Point. Hmm. And so when these cadets got to West Point, they were told the people, the two women who wrote Jesus Loves Me is right across the river there. And these two women began having Bible studies, and for 30 years they taught the Bible to the cadets at the military academy at West Point. And when they died, they were both given military funerals. Oh with full military honors at the cemetery there at West Point, I visited their grave, and to this day, West Point maintains Constitution Island and their home in memory of them as a museum. Fantastic. Well, you know, when we think of, of the songs uh, for little children, 
an experience one evening, Gordy Morris, one of our guys on the staff, was uh, many years ago, back in the days when we used to spin records, he uh, had a phone call, someone calling from Children's Hospital. And they said, do you have the song Near My God to Thee that you could play? And so Gordy went and found it, and he said, yes, we can do that, and immediately put it on the air. A few minutes afterwards, uh, the phone call came back to the control room, and this man was now weeping on the phone. He said, thank you for having that song for us. Here we are in Children's Hospital. Our little seven-year-old boy just slipped away to be with Jesus, and you had that song. We were alone, and that song was there with us as he went to be with Jesus. Isn't that a story? Yeah. What a story that is. And that great hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, yeah. uh, reportedly was the song that the orchestra played on board the Titanic as that mm. great ship slipped beneath the waters. Mm. Many years ago when I was a little kid, I remember uh, we had the privilege of being in the home of a man named F.M. Lehman. He wrote the song, The Love of God. Oh, yes. And uh, I remember I was I was very, very young at that time, but I remember Dad and uh, Mr. Lehman went into the office, and there on the wall was a, a printing plate that was the first plate used in printing that song. And... Uh, that uh, does go back a few years, but it was uh, songs are so special. Well, we're going to be uh, going on a little further here with this as far as the earliest hymn that you've found. What is the earliest hymn that you're aware of? The earliest hymn that is still frequently sung around the world, the earliest Christian hymn, non-biblical hymn, uh, dates to right after the time of the Apostles. We call it the Gloria Patre. And uh, people who grew up in a liturgical church, maybe a Methodist or Presbyterian church, uh, perhaps sang it every morning uh, or every Sunday morning. It says, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Mm. Amen, amen. We don't really know who wrote it, but it's from very, very, very early in Christian history. And that's the oldest hymn that is still regularly sung in churches today. Well, folks, you can, uh, some mornings wake, do you ever wake up singing a song? I, I do. Uh, some things I hear, uh, sometimes I hear a song in my head and I get up and find myself kind of humming it along. And these are the songs embedded in our hearts. What would it be if we had tornadoes like Joplin and all of the, all of the hymnals and our churches were destroyed? What songs would be, we'd be singing next Sunday morning from memory? Important question. Well, we're going to be taking a break in just a few brief moments here, but I want to mention again that uh, this book, one of three, in fact, if you want to contact uh, our guest today at robertjmorgan.com, he has three books, actually, book number one, two, and three, called Then Sings My Soul, the story of our songs, drawing strength from the great hymns of our faith. And I'd suggest that you would uh, be really blessed to have these in your library and uh, when we come back, we're going to have some more uh, things to talk about here. Then we'll open the lines and let you call in and let us know how important these hymns are to you and to your family. Right now, we're going to go take a break, and we'll be right back right after this. Most people devote much time researching and investigating important issues before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. Yet when faced with the most important issue of their earthly life, where will I spend eternity, they appear to be unconcerned or disinterested. Since God does not promise anyone tomorrow, and man's eternal destiny is sealed at death, would it not be wise to investigate these things? That's the purpose of the book, Preparing for Eternity, in which author Mike Gendron contrasts the truth of God's Word with the teachings and traditions he was taught for over 30 years in the Roman Catholic Church. He found that eternal life is not merited by good works, but is given freely by God's grace to those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their all-sufficient Savior. The book, Preparing for Eternity, is available for a donation of $17 or more to VCY America by calling 1-800-729-9829. That's 1-800-729-9829.
And welcome back to Cross Talk. Our theme, Then Sings My Soul, the story of our songs drawing strength from the great hymns of our faith. The author of these three books, and book number three is now out, Robert J. Morgan. And uh, I just say these are a beautiful, beautiful addition to your family library. Not only the stories of the hymns, but the music's there, too. You can sing right off the page. I uh, I had a couple of questions I want to ask you about your favorite hymns, and I know you have some stories that maybe you could share with us today. First of all, I notice in your list of, of favorites is the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. Many years ago in 1955, my wife and I had the privilege of uh, sitting in the Pasadena Civic Auditorium. Phil Kerr had what they called Monday Night Musicals, and uh, George Bernard came to tell his story. I don't remember all the details, but you do. And, well, uh, I would love to have been there. <laughs> you, I, you know, I feel like I should uh, be interviewing you because you have so many wonderful memories of uh, of some of these songwriters uh, of the um, 20th century. But George Bernard um, was an itinerant evangelist. He started out as a minor, uh, went into uh, evangelism after he was saved, and he's one of the ones that would just catch the trains from town to town, uh, go where he was invited, preach revivals and evangelistic campaigns at churches, and see multitudes of people come to the Lord. And he would take his guitar with him, and he would write music all along the way. And the interesting thing, Vic, about the old rugged cross is there are three different places that claim to be the birthplace of this hymn. One is in Michigan. The other one is in Wisconsin. Uh, and then there is another site in Michigan as well. And there are markers up at all three saying this is the birthplace of the hymn, the old rugged cross. Well, the reason, of course, was because he was working on it while he was traveling. And he would uh, work on it some and they'd sing it at a church. And then he would work on it some more while he was traveling uh, and go to another meeting and get a quartet together and say, why don't you try singing this song I'm working on? And so it sort of developed uh, over time. But there are three different places that have markers up claiming to be the Mm. birthplace of uh, uh, the old rugged cross. But George Bernard said that he uh, wrote this hymn uh, as he was going through a time of great difficulty, and ten words came to his mind. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And he said, I started with those ten words, and I just kept working on it. And, of course, it was therapy for him as well as ministry. Many years ago, a young pastor, Pastor Gary Clark from Englewood, Florida, was here in the studios, and it was 11 o'clock at night. We were in the recording studio up on second floor, and he looked at me and said, Vic, let's make a CD, and Gary has a lovely voice. And uh, so uh, his wife ran the controls, and I went over to the piano, and uh, we uh, did, I think it was 12 or 13 songs, and uh, one of them was The Old Rugged Cross. After the the CD was produced, and we must have put out several hundred of them, we, uh, I sent one to a dear friend down in Charleston, Illinois. And uh, it was, I got a phone call back from this dear lady. Her husband had Alzheimer's disease, and uh, he was failing. And uh, she went by, I think it was the hospital or the nursing home, to pick him up on Sunday to take him for a ride. And she'd just gotten a copy of Gary's uh, recording. And one of the songs there was The Old Rugged Cross. And as as they were driving, he hadn't spoken a word in many, many weeks. She called and said this. She began to play, and here came the song, The Old Rugged Cross. And as they were driving, she heard him start to speak. He hadn't spoken in a long time. And here he was singing along, and she said the tears were coming down his face as his memory and his voice came back, sang right along with Gary, and then as the song concluded that his conclusion of expression also stopped and that was the last she heard from him wow but it's uh, the power of those songs and and how god has used them what a thrill now what about when i survey the wondrous cross when i survey the wondrous cross was written by isaac watts and the thing about watts that's so interesting is that he came along at a time when hymns really were not sung in the british church uh, only the Psalms of David were sung in most churches. There had been uh, some movement to try to introduce hymns, 
but the uh, uh, clergy were, uh, so many of them was adamantly against it. Uh, they thought that only the metrical psalms should be sang from the Bible. And so there weren't any hymns being sung anywhere. And Isaac Watts was 19, 20 years of age. He'd just gotten back home to Southampton, England from being in college, had graduated. Uh, he was living back at home. He went to uh, uh, his uh, church above Bar Congregational Church with his uh, dad and mom. And on the way home, he said, you know, I enjoyed church a great deal, but the music was terrible. These <laughs> metrical psalms are very difficult to sing. And his father said, well, why don't you try a song? So he had been studying the book of Revelation, chapter 5, and he wrote a hymn called Behold the Glories of the Lamb, and he brought it back to his church the next week, and they sang it, and they liked it so much they asked for another one, and he began writing a song every week, a hymn, an original hymn, Hmm. for his church in Southampton, England. Um, And when people found out that church was singing hymns, it caused a lot of controversy. I can imagine. But uh, Isaac Watts moved on down to London, became the pastor of a church there where he stayed the rest of his life, and helped introduce hymn singing to the uh, English churches. And so we call him the father of English hymnody, even though he was only 18 or 19 when he started. But he's the one who wrote that wonderful hymn, based upon uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 14, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. I know that my Redeemer lives. Well, isn't that a wonderful song? You know who uh, wrote that to begin with? Hmm. Is um, Job. Yes. That's, you know, so many of our great hymns, the words come uh, from the book of uh, Job, but mm-hmm. the... Uh, hymn that we typically sing today, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, uh, was written by Samuel Medley, mm-hmm. who uh, lived about the same time as uh, Isaac Watts. It's an early English hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, What Comfort This Assurance Gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead, he lives my everlasting head. Now, there are several different hymns under the title, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, but my favorite one is this one that goes all the way back to the early 1700s mm-hmm. in England. O Stura Gud, Scandinavian, for how great thou art. Yes, there's two stories uh, behind this. Uh, One has to do with the writing of it, but I think what I'd like to tell you is the story behind the publishing of it. Mm -hmm. There was a man by the name of Tim Spencer, who was a, uh, uh, he worked in the mines in Oklahoma. He was injured. Uh, As he uh, rehabilitated, he decided that he wanted to go into music, and so he started singing uh, country and gospel, or country and uh, southern and country and western music down at the bar uh, near his home, a place <laughs> called the Bucket of Blood. Oh, my uh, goodness. He was uh, pretty good, and so he became regionally known, and he moved to California. He took up with a couple of other guys, and they created a, uh, a musical group called the Sons of the Pioneers, and oh, yes. one of his partners was uh, Roy Rogers. Hmm. And so uh, Tim Spencer went on the road with the Sons of the Pioneers, went all over the country singing. Uh, He was married, his wife was a Christian, but Tim was not a Christian, and he didn't live like one. And he wrote a best-selling song, very popular in its day, Cigarettes, Whiskey, and Wild, Wild Women. Oh, my goodness. And it hit the top of the charts, and that pretty well described the way that he was living while he was on the road. But his wife, back in Hollywood, was praying for him. And he checked into a hotel one day in Pennsylvania. He uh, had a letter from her. He picked up a Gideon Bible that was in the hotel room. He started reading it, and Tim Spencer was wonderfully converted. Hmm. He came back to California, gave up the uh, life on the road, started a music publishing company called Mana Music. Oh, yes? And his son, Hal, was in college at the time. And Hal came back from a missionary conference, a student missionary meeting, and he said, Dad, there was a missionary, Stuart Hine, that taught us this song that he had written and you ought to look at it. You might want to publish it. And Tim Spencer looked at it, and he did publish it. And that's the way the author of the song, Cigarettes, Whiskey, and Wild Wild Women, came to be the man who published the song, How Great hmm. Thou Art. Well, it's original, I know, with Carl Boberg back in the Scandinavian countries as well. Yes, and, he, wrote uh, the, he wrote the original Scottish lyrics, right. and then Stuart Hine was a missionary, mm-hmm. and he adapted it and created the English version, and then Tim Spencer is the one that published it. Oh, and then you. George Beverly Shea and the Billy Graham choirs with Cliff Barrows made it famous all around the world. 
History and folks' books filled with hymn stories. Then Sings My Soul, the story of our songs, drawing strength from the great hymns of our faith. Book number three now available, robertjmorgan.com, and uh, you can contact them if you'd like to order it through VCY Crosstalk. It's available for a donation of $23. However, I would suggest you contact the website of Mr. Morgan, Pastor Morgan, because uh, you can talk to them about books number one and two, which are also out there, and we would suggest that a great library. We're going to open our phone lines here. We have about 12 minutes remaining in the program, but we're going to open the lines right now for your comments, folks. Our phone number, 800-733-9829, 800-733-9829. What do the hymns mean to you, to your family, to your kids? Are we jipping them? Are we literally denying them some of the rich heritage that is found in these great songs of our faith? Our telephone lines have jammed. Literally, every line in the studio has jammed. So we're going to uh, take as many calls as quickly as we can, and uh, we will have a brief break at about 44, but then we have about eight minutes after that. So we'll take your comments, make them short and to the point, and we will uh, certainly look forward to that. Again, our telephone number, 800-733-9829. And uh, as soon as I've got uh, the screen here with the name, there it is, Jim in Mobile, Alabama. Jim, welcome to the program. Hello, Jim. Hi. Yes, you're on the air. How are you? Just fine, sir. Oh, that's great, sir. Yeah, I I love uh, Just a Closer Walk With Thee is my favorite mm-hmm. song. I, I sing it in church all the time, and I, I love it. And also uh, Gathering Flowers for the Master's Bouquet. Mm-hmm. Oh. And I have written a song that I took from the Lord gave me one morning at 4 o'clock in the morning when I lived mm-hmm. in California. I woke up at 4 o'clock, and I was writing until 9 o'clock. I wrote 12 verses, and I picked out a song out of it. Well, you know, Jim, the 12 verses thing was very familiar because my Scandinavian background, I grew up bilingual. And uh, we used to sing with the psalmist, and, which was this little Swedish hymn book, and uh, we'd read, uh, sing in English and then in Swedish. So uh, they had 13 verses in those days. Jim, thanks for the call from Mobile. Let's go to Craig in Georgia. Craig, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I remember back 11 years ago, the Lord used the song, I Surrender All, when he dealt with my heart about preaching the gospel. Mm. Um, I had been saved, uh, but I got away from the Lord and spent many years out of his will. And, but I remember for an invitation song, they sang that song, and the Lord uh, dealt with my heart. And I'm so glad that I finally did surrender everything to him. And uh, I, I can say that's the best choice that I ever made mm. about my life. Pastor Morgan. Yes, well, All to Jesus I Surrender is another one of those great uh, invitational hymns that we were talking about a few minutes ago. It was written by Judson W. Van Dyck Venter, and uh, he was a Michigan young man who came to the Lord at the age of uh, 17, went to Hillsdale College, uh, ended up uh, uh, being a, uh, a choir member in a local church, and then ended up uh, leading songs at different mm-hmm. meetings, and he wrote this. Uh, as an expression of his own surrender to full-time Christian ministry. We're going to be back in just 60 seconds. Stay with us. This is Crosstalk. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website's worldviewweekend.com. I did a series of radio shows on 20 characteristics of false teachers embraced by the false church. I'd like to share those with you through the next several commentaries. Number one, false teachers are insincere and use God's word for personal gain. We get that from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. False teachers use the word of God often distorted, out of context, twisted, for their own personal gain, largely also financial personal gain. Two, false teachers have a form of godliness but deny God. Second Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form of godliness but denying his power. And from such people turn away. False teachers will look like Christians, sound like Christians, talk like Christians, but they deny the essential Christian doctrines and we're warned to turn away from them. For more information, our website's worldviewweekend.com.
And welcome back to Crosstalk. And today we're talking, well, give the, give the program a title, Then Sings My Soul, Hymn Stories with Reverend Robert Morgan, a man who's put together three wonderful books, Then Sings My Soul, book one, two, and three, with stories about the old hymns and gospel songs that mean so much to each and every one of us. And uh, we have callers lined up from all over the country. We're going to go to Milton, Florida right now and talk with Chris. Chris, you're on the air. Hey, Vic. Praise God. I'm getting blessed. I've, I've given that book, or the first book, as a gift. I want to tell you something. I'm 81 years old. I began singing in the choir in 1948 in Turkey. The choir director was a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. I was not saved, but I know God used hymns to draw me. Hmm. I want to share with you that last month I went to the funerals of two in my church, a black sister and a white sister. They were both both terminal senior citizens. I went to the hospital to pray with them. One had not been able to speak. The other was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. After praying with each of them, I started singing, Jesus loves me, and both sang out loud with me. Mm. What a blessing. Oh, thank you. Oh, my God, it was so wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that from Milton, Florida. Let's move to a pleasant prairie and uh, is it Treva? Yes, Treva. Treva, you're on the air. Well, thank you. Um, I just really miss the hymns. The choruses are okay, but the hymns are my heart. And I just feel the children of uh, our country now are missing out, and they don't know the history of some of these songs, why they were written and how they were written. And so I really, really am sorry about that. And one of my favorite ones is Ferris Lord Jesus. That one is very, very tender to my heart. You know where I learned that song? When? In public school when I was a kid. Was oh, that? you know, I wish they could do that again. Yeah. We've just really hurt our children by taking Jesus and the Bible and things out of the school now, and they're just missing so much of life. Well, you know, the other the other day I mentioned on the air, because I do some keyboard work, and there's such a dearth of, of accompaniment just for the basic old hymns that we're talking about here. And I mentioned on the air just saying, uh, how would it be if we put like 10 or 12 hymns, uh, recorded piano, uh, sure. in a manner that was singable along with the word sheets? These are public domain. Yes. And making them available, and the phones began to ring. Said, "Vic, will you do this?" And oh. so uh, we're working on something like that for the future here, not too far down the road. But oh. if there are families that are interested, uh, let us mm-hmm. know because this is something we can do here and make them available as well. But the oh, hymns, that's wonderful. But the hymns, that is great. I just ordered the book number one. So. Oh, great. <laughs> well, number number one. But th- this is book number three we're talking about today. Oh, you're talking number three. Well, I'm just getting number one. That's all I can okay. do right now. But well, then I'll get the other two later on. God, know. God bless you, Treva. Thank Th- you very much. Thank God you. bless you. Let's go to Wisconsin Rapids and Jared. Hey, brother Rick, how are you doing today? Fine, sir. Good. Hey, I just wanted to call. Um, I was born again in July of 2008, and my wife was born again on Good Friday 2010, and we love the hymns. Amen. Um, our church uh, fellowship, we sing about two-thirds hymns and probably a third more contemporary songs, which are the more powerful, less repetitive contemporary songs. So we don't have anything against contemporary music, but the well, hymns are full of doctrine and the truth of God's Word, which is timeless. And uh, we've already begun to teach our children. We have three. Uh, our oldest is four and a half. His name mm. is Javan, and he can sing the first couple verses of Rock of Ages. Oh, that's, that is wonderful. Well, Jer- that's kind of our family anthem to the Lord, Rock of Ages. So I just wanted to share that and uh, any comments about that song, if you have any. Well, Jared, here is just one word. that The word contemporary music is being often misused because all the word contemporary means. It's not a music style. It means that the author is still living. <laughs> so that's true. <laughs> so if you write a good song, the one that's singable, uh, it's a, it can be a blessing, my friend. You got that right. Hey, thanks for all you guys do at VCY, and I pray that more of the uh, the brethren out in the community would hear from you guys mm. and the the vision that Lord has given you to uphold the gospel. So thanks a lot. God bless you, Jared. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, just about time for one more call. We're going to go to Burlington and talk with Laura. Laura, you're on the air. Hi. Your comment. Yes, I'm calling about a hymn that really blessed me. It was over 30 years ago now. I fell off a runaway horse and fractured my skull. Mm. There were a lot of things I couldn't do right then. I couldn't read and I couldn't, you know, go out and move around. But I could sit at the piano and I could play and I could, you know, just sing. And I just sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, over and over. And to this day, it's just, 
makes my spirit reverberate. Come thou fount of every blessing. Pastor, your thoughts. It's from the middle 1700s, and it was written by a man named Robert Robinson. And uh, he um, interestingly uh, wrote that hymn, uh, got away from the Lord, but came back partially because of his own hymn. Um, he um, was just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, but this was his uh, his great hymn that he gave to us. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Uh, and the last uh, stanza says, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And how often does that uh, represent a prayer that's appropriate for us to pray in our own lives? Thank you so much, Laura, for your call. Pastor, you have just uh, about a minute and a half to go, and I'm going to give you that minute to share your heart. Well, one of my favorite hymns comes from St. Francis of Assisi. It comes from the 1200s, and it's based really on Psalm 148. And it's a great hymn or anthem of praise. It said that St. Francis, he would preach to people, he would preach to the birds of the sky, he would preach to the clouds, to the sun, to the moon, and uh, that's in keeping with Psalm 148. And so he wrote this song called Canticle to Brother Son, and we sing it today as all creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing Alleluia. Alleluia. And I think that as we sing these great hymns and as we keep hymn books uh, by our bedside and as we use them in our devotions, as we sing them in our churches, that it is doing something for us that nothing else apart from Scripture itself can do. So I would encourage people to learn the stories of the great hymns, to pick up these books, Then Sings My Soul, Book 1, Book 2, and Book 3, to share them with their friends, to give them to their ministers of music, and let's keep the singing of the great hymns alive in our hearts and in our churches. Thank you so much, Pastor Morgan. The address, again, the email address or the website, robertjmorgan.com. And uh, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, a great library to consider. Version 3 is out now, available through uh, the website, or you can contact VCY America uh, in either way you'd like to. Thanks so much for being with us, Pastor. Stay with us as soon as we leave. I'd like to chat with you, but I want to thank everybody for joining and calling, and uh, thanks again for a great book. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Please stand by. We'll be right coming up on the end of the program but uh, be sure to call get that website and get the book thanks for joining us you've been listening to crosstalk via satellite and the internet from bcy america views expressed may or may not be those of this station for a cd of today's program send a donation of six dollars or more to vcy take ministry 3434 west kilbourne avenue milwaukee wisconsin 53208 or download by rss or podcast from crosstalkamerica.com and join us again for crosstalk crosstalk